How did the nature of warfare change between 1700 and 1850? Now, this is an interesting period of time, because in 1700, armies marched or rode on horseback to war in brightly coloured uniforms, fighting with muskets, bayonets and heavy cannon. By 1900, however, armies were in camouflaged brown or grey uniforms with little cavalry, rifles and machine guns had replaced muskets, and they now had long distance artillery or light artillery which pounded the enemy. So there is a massive amount of change between 1700 to 1900. However, the period of 1700 to 1850 did not see the same level of change as 1850 to 1900. So we'll be looking at those two different periods separately. But overall, we'll be looking at how do things stay the same, how they changed, what trends continue through this period from the previous periods we've looked at, and what turning points are there. So first of all, we'll look at the size of the armies. Now, as we said already, 1700 to 1850 was a period of little change in warfare. And actually, there wasn't a huge amount of change in the size of the armies. England now had a standing army of roughly 50,000 men. It changed throughout this period, depending on whether there was a war being fought or not. Now, this was a small army compared to other countries like France. Um, and the army would grow during wars, but then reduce in peacetime. So, for example, in 1813, the army was, had reached 250,000 men. Um, but it returned down to 130,000 in 1819 after the war with France was over. So the army changed whether England was at war or not. The composition of the army also saw little change. Infantry was still the dominant part of the army. In 1700 it made up 75% of the army, whilst by 1850 it was up to 80%. So a slight trend towards a growth in the importance of infantry. Cavalry, on the other hand, was slowly declining from 20% in 1700 to 15% in 1850, and actually a lot of the cavalry were now dragoons who were soldiers who would ride on horseback but then dismount to fight. And artillery still made up around 5% of the army, as although artillery improved in this time, still wasn't the most effective fighting force. Similarly, weapons saw little change. Infantry continued to use their most basic weapon, the Brown Bess Musket. It had been in service since 1715 and was used for over 130 years, with around 8 million being made in this time. It was a very simple muzzle-loaded musket which fired a lead ball that weighed 30 grams. It was effective up to about 100 metres. For close combat, it would be fitted with a 45 centimetre bayonet for stabbing and thrusting at the enemy. Cavalry mainly used swords in this period, um, sometimes with pistols, though dragoons had but muskets as well and would dismount and fight on foot. The artillery used cannon with a range of about 500 metres. They would use cannonballs against walls or for large groups of infantry or grape shot or canisters to spray infantry but at the beginning of this period, cannons were still very heavy and difficult to move. So we start to see here one of our bigger changes in this period, and that was with light field artillery. In 1700, a cannon with ammunition and its carriage could weigh up to four tonnes, and so were too heavy to be moved around for battles, four tonnes being roughly the weight of an elephant. This meant that cannon were still mostly used for sieges or against fixed targets, um, and were used a lot less in battles on the field. However, the Industrial Revolution started to see a change here. Because of the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot more iron, and it was cheap, cheaper, so it could be experimented with. So, for example, in 1720, Britain produced just 25 tonnes of iron. In 1790, they'd moved up to 70,000 tonnes of iron, and by 1850, 2 million tonnes. So we started to see a lot more experimentation with iron. One example of this was from John Iron Mad Wilkinson, who was a pioneer of using iron in battle and he was able to bore out a piece of iron um, so that the cannon was only the width of the cannonball making it a lot more accurate and actually lighter. Now actually the other big development was they started using bronze which was a lot lighter, a lot more expensive but lighter than using iron um, and so could be used more effectively. 
Overall, lighter field artillery meant it could be pulled around quickly and so be used more in battle. In terms of strategy, the English army still relied on limited warfare. Now, this is the most common form of warfare and it basically meant using raids, skirmishes and sometimes sieges rather than full-scale battles. And this was largely because often rulers led the armies and did not want to be captured or caught. If they thought they might be defeated, they might be ransomed and that could cause a lot of problems for the country. Also, muskets and artillery now meant that there could be huge loss of life in battles which armies could not afford. Transport and communications were slow, meaning that the messages about where the armies were were quite difficult to pass around. And Britain's strategy overall was to, number one, rely on their navy to protect the country on the English Channel, and so did not want a large expensive army, but also to pay other countries to fight with them so their army could stay small. So in this area there was little change in this period. There were some changes in the way that infantry were used on the battlefield. So tactics started to become more complex in a full-scale battle, particularly for the infantry. Musket fire had improved, meaning they could reload a lot more rapidly, and they only needed to be in lines too deep so they could reload quick and fire enough. Um, so this meant they could have longer, less deep lines, and actually that meant they had to kind of tr practice moving around quicker to get into different formations. This was helped by the development of marching. Now marching improved as the English armies introduced rhythmic marching from 1760, meaning that infantry could be moved quickly around the battlefield, which meant they could change formation for different purposes. So when attacking, infantry either formed a line parallel to the enemy and marched towards them, or a column to try and punch through their lines. In defence, infantry formed into squares, not unlike a shieldron, to protect themselves. Overall, the infantry were better organised and more flexible during the battle, which was important as infantry became the main part of the army. Now, the devastating damage caused by musket fire also changed the use of cavalry on the battlefield. So they were used, much like the infantry, to try and be more fluid in the battlefield and try and move around more. They're too vulnerable to muskets for full frontal charges, Wellington, the commander of the English army, rarely used them for this in his 19th century battles. However, they were useful for moving quickly around the battlefield, scouting and harassing the enemy whilst engaging with their cavalry. So they were much more effective as skirmishers and to be fighting around the edges of the battle rather than being one of the main forces that fought within the battle. The development of lighter field infantry also started to have an impact. Lighter guns could be moved, which meant they were more useful in battle and could be positioned in different places as the battle progressed. They could be moved to sit in front of infantry to defend lines. They could then potentially withdraw to safety within a square and when the enemy got near. Or they could also move to high ground to bombard the enemy. So the artillery became a lot more flexible. As artillery became more useful, it was used more. So Wellington had 216 different guns at Waterloo in 1815. Now, although there was some change, there can be no doubt that change was very slow in this period. This is for several reasons. Social attitudes slowed change by keeping the size of the army small and limiting spending. Armies cost more money, which meant higher taxes, so people did not want to pay taxes. They also felt that an army might be a danger to their freedom, as the ruler could impose his will more effectively. Political attitudes also slowed change. People saw the impact of the French Revolution in France and were nervous of any sort of change in England and so wanted to keep the army small. Individuals sometimes had quite a large impact, often in a positive way, but often in a negative way as well. So the Duke of Wellington, a very successful English general, um, generally blocked any change in tactics in the army, slowing down any change or any innovation in the armed forces. Now, we've mentioned a couple of times industrialisation starts to have an impact on weapons, but actually, at this point, it was still only the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so the impact was still relatively limited. So, in summary, 1700 to 1850 was a time of little change in the nature of warfare. Size of armies, compositions and weapons saw little change in this period. The England now did have a standing army, and the decline in cavalry 
a long-term trend continued. The commander still relied on limited warfare to avoid major battles. Improvements in industry saw lighter field artillery being produced, which con contributed to new fluid tactics. So overall, the tactics stayed the same, but the tactics on the battlefield changed significantly. Infantry, artillery and cavalry were expected to move rapidly around the battlefield and react to new tactical ideas and formations such as the defensive square or the column. Change was largely slow due to social and political attitudes and the views of individuals. Technological, ch technological change started to be seen through the Industrial Revolution, but this was still limited.